Let me invite you, if you can, to open your Bibles to the Gospel according to Mark. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20 this morning. And as we let our eyes fall on those verses, as we hear them this morning, let's remember that this is God's Word. This is our Creator speaking to us. This is God speaking to us about His Son. Let's listen to His voice through this Word this morning. Mark 1, 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. On December 8th, 1863... The following official proclamation was issued. It included the following remarkable words. Whereas a rebellion now exists, whereby the loyal state governments of several states have for a long time been subverted, and many persons have committed and are now guilty of treason against the United States, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, do proclaim, declare, and make known to all persons who have directly or by implication participated in the existing rebellion, except as hereinafter accepted, that a full pardon is hereby granted to them. The president, who had been the recipient of the most hateful mockery and, more importantly, years of rebellion, was offering to his enemies to come to him in peace, offering a full pardon and a full restoration. He was inviting them to take a new oath of allegiance to restore themselves to their former loyalty. He was offering peace in the face of warfare. Yet, as valuable as that proclamation was, the call we have before us in Mark chapter 1 is better still. This is not just a national rebellion in treason. This is a cosmic rebellion. This is not just a state insurrection. This is divine, cosmic treason and this call comes from not just an earthly ruler, but from God himself to the very ones who have mocked and despised him. This same call comes to them. This gospel, this invitation, it goes out into all the world, and we need to hear it again this morning. It is the greatest offer of pardon that could be imagined. So we need to hear it this morning and we need to marvel at it. Let's let the message of the Son of God ring in every heart this morning. Let's let it ring in your heart. Let's let it echo in your heart. Our treason was punishable by death and eternal exile. And yet God, God the Son invites us to come to Him and to his Father in peace. 
This is God's Son inviting sinners into God's kingdom. This is Jesus Christ calling us to come to God through Him. This is a declaration of pardon for those who will come to Him. And we need this voice in our hearts. We need it. We need to marvel at it. We need it more than anything. And so Mark records this call coming from Jesus himself so that it would echo through the ages even to this morning in this building where God and God the Son can reissue this invitation, this call directly into the ears and heart of every person seated here so that you can hear his voice calling you to come to God through him. You can hear his voice reminding you that this was the invitation he issued to you if you are a Christian. This is the call we need to hear. This entree into ministry, Mark describes in two sections. He begins with the news we need to hear, and he continues with the one we need to follow. That's how I would caption these two sections of Jesus beginning his ministry and then Jesus calling his first disciples. The news we need to hear and the one we need to follow. Let's dive in and let's, let's listen for this voice this morning. Let's listen for it. You listen for it this morning. I believe the Lord Jesus wants to reissue it to you. You listen to it this morning. Notice in this opening section, this news that we need to hear. First, the context. It says that John was arrested. That opening phrase signaled to Jesus that the time for his public ministry had begun. The forerunner's time had concluded. And with John's arrest, Jesus is launched, as it were, into his own time of public proclamation. It's also worth remembering that the, the context of suffering in the proclamation of the gospel, would surely have been encouraging to Christians reading this gospel in Rome under the Roman Emperor Nero. Surely it would have encouraged them that from the very beginning, from the very outset of the publication of the gospel, it was surrounded by the opposition and the suffering that takes place every time the gospel goes forward in this earth. Surely Roman Christians would have been encouraged that it was was when John was arrested that the gospel went forth. So in that context of suffering, Jesus begins proclaiming the gospel of God. Let's look at the content of this message. It is good news, which Mark has already told us is the title of this book. It is good news. It is of God, meaning it is from God. It has God's divine stamp of authority. This is, this is God's message for the world. God's headline for the world that Jesus will proclaim And this message says that the time is fulfilled. The time has come, Jesus says. The Jewish people would have waited for hundreds of years for the coming of God's eschatological, his end time kingdom, the coming of his Messiah that would reverse all of their judgments, that would restore all of their privileges and their freedoms. And Jesus is declaring that time has been fulfilled. The last prophet has just been arrested The ultimate prophet is now proclaiming that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. That that means that God's final kingdom has been brought near. It has been brought near. It is as if he's saying, three, two, one, now. Now is the time, Jesus says. Now is the time for the good news. Now the waiting is over. Now the kingdom has come. Now the entrance of God's kingdom into this world will begin. Now it is near, Jesus says. It is at hand. Jesus declares this kingdom of God to be at hand. And Mark's point in letting Jesus make this statement and letting it be announced as he enters his ministry is that this kingdom centers on and arrives in the person of Jesus Christ. You notice that it is when Jesus enters ministry that the kingdom is at hand. You notice that it is in Jesus' proclaiming of the gospel that the kingdom is at hand. Mark's making the point. The kingdom of God is found in and arrives in the person of Jesus Christ. 
If, you, if you've ever wondered, how, how do we reconcile what we talk about, about forgiveness of sins and the gospel being reconciliation with God, with all that Jesus says about the kingdom? Well, the gospel writers would say that the kingdom is the arrival of God's rule in the person of his son. He is the entrance into that kingdom. He is the center of it. He is the focus of it. That is what it means to be in the kingdom. It means to come to God through his son. The word kingdom, even in the Greek, doesn't, doesn't necessarily focus primarily on a, a physical domain, though it certainly could mean that. It focuses primarily on a rulership over a people, a sovereignty over a people. And what Mark is saying is this sovereignty is available to you in the person of the one making the invitation. Here the king himself comes to his exiled and rebellious world and says, come, come back into the kingdom in me. There is no entrance into God's kingdom apart from the doorway of that kingdom, which is God's Son. In the famous analogy of the Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan illustrates this by talking about uh, two people that jumped over the wall to get into the way, and they are rebuked. Because in reality, there is no way into God's kingdom apart from encountering it and entering it through Jesus Christ. That's Mark's point. It is the gospel of God from God, but it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that centers on him and is entered through him. You cannot enter the kingdom of God or experience it merely by doing the works of the kingdom separate from the person of the kingdom. So just because you're a good person or a nice citizen or a good neighbor, you are not thereby in the kingdom of God. You might even do good Christian things. You might connect with Christians a lot or you might reach out with uh, Christian activities. And yet, if you are not coming through the way of the kingdom, which is God's son, you are no closer to the kingdom than a person who is rebelling against it. There are religious people who are outside the kingdom, and there are pagan people who are outside the kingdom, but both are outside the kingdom unless they have come to God the Son. It is in Jesus that people come into this kingdom, that they experience it, and that they encounter God in it. You can only come to God through the person of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of God, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The arrival of the kingdom has come in him. Now, this is surprising. This is surprising that Jesus calls the coming of God's kingdom good news. Has it ever struck you as strange that sinners should pray, let your kingdom come? Has it ever struck you as strange? How strange would it have been for confederates to pray, let the federal government come into my town? or barracks. And yet that's what a sinner is praying every time they pray, let your kingdom come. How strange for a criminal to pray that the police would arrive. How strange for someone in the act of thievery to pray that the district attorney would arrive. And yet sinners praying, let your kingdom come, are praying something much more dangerous and much more profound. Isn't that odd? Isn't that surprising that Jesus would say it's good news for the kingdom of holiness and righteousness to come to the world of treachery and sin. Why is that good news? Good news, God says. Good news. We find that the entrance into this kingdom requires repentance and belief. It requires turning away from an old way of life and rebellion against God and turning to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are required to believe as good news something that should not be good news. Why is that? Tuck that question in your mind and let it linger there as we continue. Why is this good news for the kingdom to come? Why can sinners pray, let your kingdom come, and honestly hope that it does? Sometimes I think, especially Western Christians, assume that the coming of God's kingdom or maybe their entrance into heaven is a good thing because of an assumption about their own character and behavior. They think of themselves as being good people, and so the coming of the kingdom is therefore good news. But that's not how God thinks about it. God thinks of the coming of his kingdom as a surprising good news, a surprising offer. 
an unexpected announcement. Good news, Jesus says. You must repent and believe. You must turn from your rebellion. Yes, you must. And you must believe in the good news that God actually offers you to come to him through the person of Jesus Christ. Good news, God says. Good news. I have brought my eternal kingdom to you in the person of my beloved son. Good news. The war that you have with God need not continue. Good news. The kingdom of darkness that has ruled over every person need not be the final word on every life. Good news. Sin does not have to be your master anymore. Good news. You don't have to spend your life simply trying to avoid bad news. Good news. Jesus has brought the kingdom of God near and it is available to all those all those who repent of their sins and believe in God's Son. Good news proclaimed in Galilee and echoing down through the ages. Good news. Now let me ask you a very direct question. Have you responded to this good news? Don't answer quickly. Answer honestly and accurately. Have you responded to this good good news? Come. Come. Repent and believe, Jesus says. Come, rebels and traitors, into the kingdom of God. Come to God through me, Jesus says. Have you responded to this good news? Have you repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't answer quickly. Answer honestly. It's no good to lie to a God who knows everything. Have you responded? Have you repented and believed? Let me appeal to you personally. We are too large a group for it not to be possible that there could be some here who have assumed they have heard the gospel and that that means they have responded to it. That would be like saying a person who gets newspapers tossed at their door every day, never opens them and never reads them, that they surely have understood what they've said. Imagine that in your front door, a stack of newspapers piling up that you don't want and you never read and that seem boring and irrelevant to you, but they're there nonetheless and they get higher and higher, rotting and worthless. And then eventually at the end of your life, the door is opened and there is God standing there pointing to this pile of invitations and saying, no, it is not enough to just hear the gospel and even know what its headlines are. It must be something that you take and receive and believe. So using that metaphor, let me ask you a very personal question. Have you heard the gospel but not repented and believed in God? Could you even state the gospel but you you haven't personally repented and believed in the one who offers it to you? You might be someone who's grown up in the church. Maybe your parents are Christians and you've heard that gospel. It's a toss against the door of your heart over and over and over again. Has it ever gotten in? Is there a stack of gospel messages that you've heard over the years when you've come on Sunday or you've gone to children's ministry or you've been to to youth meetings and you've heard those gospel messages? You can list them. There's hundreds of them, but they're all standing and rotting outside the door of your heart doing nothing because they never get in. Jesus is not calling you just to hear about the gospel. He's calling you to repent and believe in it, to believe in the good news. So let me urge you, if you have not repented and believed in the good news, do it now. Repent of your sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not say that you can go to God with all the things you've heard. The hearing of the gospel is no salvation. It is having Jesus as your Savior that saves you, not just knowing what that salvation is. Repent and believe. Commentator William Lane helps us to feel the urgency of Jesus' words. He says, provision has been made for men to repent, but there is no time for delay. Jesus accordingly calls men to a radical decision. In Jesus, men are confronted by the word and act of God. He himself is the crucial term by which belief and unbelief come to fruition. Jesus proclaims the kingdom not to give content, but to convey a summons. He stands as God's final word of address to man in man's last hour. Either a man will submit to the summons of God or he chooses this world and its riches and honor. The either or character of this decision is of immense importance and permits of no postponement. That is what repentance is all about. Jesus himself 
though veiled in the midst of men, becomes the crucial term by which men may enter the kingdom of God or exclude themselves from it. Listen, men, women, boys, girls, you are presented with a decision by God the Son. Either you will repent and believe or you will be condemned and judged. There is no alternative middle ground. There is no nice but not Christian ground. There is either believing and repenting in Jesus or there is God's condemnation. There is no other way by which you can be saved, not because of your parents, not because of your background, not because of your superiority to your neighbors, only because you have repented and believed in Jesus. Just this week, it was perpetually on the news, the tragic story of a 13-year-old girl who died with her father on the way to a basketball game. That's what Jesus is saying. Now. You should repent now. You should turn now to the Lord Jesus. God has not promised you tomorrow. You may have no chance in your final seconds to think of anything but trying to stay alive. And as those seconds slip away, so does your chance to respond, repent, and believe. Mark is so earnest about this. He wants it to be personal. And so he continues from this summary of Jesus' preaching to a very personal story about people responding to him. He doesn't want this to just be a, a narrative account of Jesus wandering Galilee and shouting on the corners without the belief that there are some who will respond to this voice. And so he continues in his second section here about the calling of these first disciples. I would caption this, the one we need to follow. The one we need to follow. Look at what he says here. He says that Jesus was passing alongside the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He's just walking along the beach. He comes across two fishermen. And he decides that he will issue this call to them. Come, follow me. Not just a general call. It is a, a personal call to them. It is his voice. And the main thing we want to notice in this passage is the authority and the power that's presented in this call. It, it's remarkable, actually. It, it would be presumptuous for a mere man to come to people on the side of the sea and say, come follow me. Try, try to imagine that moment. Imagine if somebody came into your workplace and just looked you in the eye and said, you come follow me right now. Now, unless that person has a badge and a stick, you're not going to do it. No, thank you. I'm, I'm mending my nets, typing my emails, going about my day. And yet in this passage, Jesus says, follow me. And they do. Mark's point, he's going to make this over and over again in the subsequent passages, is about the authority of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways his authority is revealed is that when he speaks into the heart of an individual and claims them as his own, that individual will respond. He will issue a broad general invitation, but he will also make these kind of personal claims. And remarkably, ordinary fishermen going about their ordinary day find an extraordinary desire to respond and cast everything aside to follow Jesus. This is remarkable. We see the authority of God's Son and yet, in spite of his incredible authority, he's not calling men because of their stature or because of their prestige. He doesn't call kings or priests or conquerors. He simply calls ordinary people in the midst of ordinary tasks. He calls them to step out of their ordinary boat into the walk of discipleship with him. And he has a mission for them to fulfill. Notice that he's not just about them following him. He wants them to help others follow him. Follow me, he says, and I will make you fishers of men. So these men are going to have the unique responsibility, not only of being followers, but of calling others to follow Jesus as well. And, and imagine how precious that little sentence, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, would be for the church in Rome when they read this book. 
probably Peter was associated with Mark and was in Rome continuing to preach this gospel. So probably there were people who had read this book who personally knew Peter, Simon, in this passage. Imagine how precious it was to them to hear. Here's the Lord Jesus telling Peter that he will fish for men. And some of those men and women that were caught in that net of the gospel would be reading these words and thinking, even at the outset of his ministry, Jesus was thinking of me. Even at the beginning of his ministry, I can point right here to when Jesus called the one who would call me. I can trace my (laughs) conversion lineage back to this moment by the Sea of Galilee when Jesus said to Simon Peter, you will become a fisher of men. And some of those men and women could say, yes, and that net caught me. Most importantly, we want to notice the personal nature of this command. They follow him. He calls first these two brothers, then goes a little farther. He sees James and John. These would be precious names to the early church, the early apostles, and here they are. Here they are, the cornerstone and foundation of the church. Here here they are, and he calls them out of their boats, away from their father, away from their lifestyle, away from everything they know, everything they have grown up to do, and he calls them to himself. I think Mark wants to accent the personal nature of this call. He called them. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They followed him. Notice the personal nature here. The first paragraph emphasizes more of the theology of this call. This paragraph emphasizes the personal nature of this call. It reminds us and the readers of Mark that ultimately, foundationally, we are called not to a system of thinking, but to a person. We are not called ultimately into a a religion of thought, but into a union with Jesus himself. Now, those thoughts are important, but at the foundational level, it is Jesus himself that we are called to, just as they were. And Mark hands this story down through the generations to let us hear that same voice, follow me, follow me. Let's pause and hear that voice. This is God's word. It is God speaking to us, quoting literally the voice of his son. Follow me. Follow me. Come. Follow me. Come to God through me, Jesus says. Follow me. We, too, need to hear this voice. So let's ask this question. Are you following Jesus? Are you following him? Not just are you living a Christian life, are you doing good things and avoiding bad things. Are you following Jesus? In your heart of hearts, in your secret moments, in your dreams and your desires, in your passions and your decisions, are you following Jesus? This is all that ultimately matters in life. This is what a Christian has decided and yet may sometimes forget. This is often the difference between a religious moral person and a person who has become a citizen of God's kingdom. A citizen in this kingdom follows the king wherever he leads. He hears the voice of the shepherd and he obeys wherever it calls. I'm not talking here about some hyper-subjectivism, wondering where the voice of Jesus might be calling us next. No, The, the call and the commands of the Lord Jesus are contained in God's word. We have them. They are present with us. I'm not saying he never guides us in the application of those commands, but the center of that voice is contained in God's words. We have it written for us. So the question I'm asking is, is the voice of the Lord Jesus contained in these scriptures? Is that the voice that we are following? Are you following him? Are we following him? 
Not just affirming him in some ancient moment before the Lord. Not just looking back at some 30-year-old promise we made of confessing our sins and saying we will follow him as Lord. Right now, are you following him? Are you following him? Not just certain beliefs that you affirm him. Are you continually getting out of the boat of your life and following him? Are you following him in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening? Will you find yourself following him on Thursday night this week? Will you find yourself following him next month when you face a trial, next year when you face a temptation? Will you find yourself following him when your final sickness lays you down and you close your eyes in death? Are you following him? Come, Jesus says, follow me. And not just these men, but those that would come after him, they would proclaim the same invitation to them. Jesus' vision here is not just for his early disciples, but for those who will believe in him through their word. Follow me, he says, through the ages. Follow me. Are we following him? If you are a Christian, the Lord Jesus' voice called you out of your boat of comfort in this life and into the path of following him. Pause for a moment. Pause for a moment and remember that when the Lord Jesus found you in the ordinary moments of your life, remember that moment, the ordinary moments of your life, you could have gone through life fishing for fish and never knowing the Lord Jesus. Looking for money and never knowing him as our treasure. Battling sin with self-atoning righteous acts and never knowing the Lord Jesus. How easy would it have been? School ends, college, work begins, family, trial, suffering, the next exciting event in our life, the next birthday, the next vacation. And before we know it, we're in our 70s and 80s. Our body is declining and we are preparing for our final act. How quickly life runs by and how easy it would have been for us to live an entire life and never hear this voice. But Jesus broke through the door of our heart. He came in and declared, follow me. And if you are a Christian, you sprung up and said, yes, Lord. Sometimes I think as Christians, we can forget that early moment of joy when the Lord said to your heart, follow me. And by his very grace and the power of his spirit, you said yes. We can forget that voice, can't we? We can forget that moment. We can forget that that's really the essence of what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is that you have said and continue to say by the grace of God, yes, Lord. So are you saying, yes, Lord, I follow you? They did not follow Jesus of their own accord, but as a result of his gracious command. And in the same way, we don't follow Jesus because of the moral strength of our will or power, but because his word regenerates our dead hearts. But there was that moment when we were made alive by his voice, and it is right for us to demonstrate that new life by a lifestyle that can be described as following Jesus. So let's ask this question of our lifestyle. Can your lifestyle be described as following Jesus? Following him means submitting your plans to him. It means speaking to those who don't know him. It means walking with him during the week. It means Centering your life on him, surrendering everything else to him. It doesn't mean necessarily like it did for these men, quitting your day job. We're not all called to be professional apostles, but we are all called to be full-time Christians, full-time followers. Jesus is not a Sunday morning Lord and a weekday memory. We are called to be following him. Jesus calls us still, come to God in me. Come, follow me. And surely, 
surely it is not too hard to follow this one when we remember how it is that he is making this invitation to us. Do you remember what I said earlier about the surprise that the kingdom is good news? The surprise that rebels can pray, let your kingdom come. That God can say, it's good news for my kingdom to be at hand. Surprising that that's good news, but in that surprise, there is the motivation that we need to follow him. In that surprise, there is the engine that keeps us going in this race of following him. Did it strike you at all? Did it strike you? I I trust it, it might not have because it doesn't often strike me at the first reading of these passages because I live in a world that assumes a upright moral person deserves God's blessing. But the Bible knows nothing of that kind of assumption about God. The Bible knows nothing of God owing people anything and everything of men owing God everything. And so because we have that wrong, lopsided assumption, we miss surprises in passages like this. So let's be surprised. Did it strike you at all, the ease and simplicity with which Jesus invites people into God's kingdom? Do we consider how it could be that Jesus can offer good news to sinners? Do we think of the kingdom as a place of easy entrance? And do we think of the good news of God as having no payment price? Do we think anything of Jesus making mere fishermen messengers of the grace of God himself? Actually, the metaphor for fishing for men was present in the Old Testament, yet primarily, and even we could say exclusively, it's actually associated with judgment. Listen to what Mark Strauss says about this. The image of fishing for people is found in the Old Testament, though always in the context of impending judgment. Jesus reverses the image to one of salvation. To fish for people is to rescue them from sin and death by calling them into God's kingdom. In one example, in Jeremiah, uh, the fishing image is used of God reaching out for his people and bringing them back. But then it is explicitly stated that before that happens, they will pay doubly for their sins. But why can Jesus reverse the order and the image in this way? Why can he offer grace to sinners? Why is it good news for the kingdom of God to come? Why? Why is it good news For God the Son to say, follow me. Why is it good news? Listen, it is not good news because we are good people. It's not good news because Jesus is adding an army of good people to his mission on earth. No, that's not why it's good news. And we don't follow him motivated by a belief in our own goodness. We follow him motivated by the surprise that it is good news for God the Son to say, follow me. Good news, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Robert William Dale helps us to glimpse the surprise when he says, the real truth is that while he came to preach the gospel, his chief object in coming was that there might be a gospel to preach. The surprise of Jesus' message is only finally resolved in the conclusion of his mission. Here is presented to us news that is called good And it does seem too good to be true, a sudden reversal of God's judgment on his sinful people, a change from an expectation of judgment to an expectation of mercy, a surprising invitation into the eternal kingdom of God. Yet we see no lambs being sacrificed, no offerings brought to the temple, no commands regarding sacrifices of bulls or goats. The kingdom of God is offered to us because the Son of God would be offered for us. The invitation is ours for free, but the price of that invitation was the sacrifice of the one making it. Jesus can freely offer grace because he would freely take judgment. Jesus can freely say, follow me, because he would ultimately face the rejection that comes from those who rebel against God. It is the exchange that we are offered when Jesus says, follow me. 
It is the surprising exchange of a kingdom that should be of judgment given to us as a kingdom of mercy. It is the surprise that merely by turning from our sin and coming to believe in the Lord Jesus that we can enter into the holy presence of God in his kingdom. That is the surprise. And that is what motivates us answering the question, yes, Lord, I will follow. Puritan book, The Valley of Vision, helps us to understand the exchange that's really going on here. When it talks about Calvary and the cross in this way, they prayed this way, their grace removes my burdens and heaps them on thy son, made a transgressor, a curse, and sin for me. There, the sword of thy justice smote the man, thy fellow. There, thy infinite attributes were magnified and infinite atonement was made. There, infinite punishment was due and infinite punishment was endured. Christ, here is the exchange. Here's why we can be offered the kingdom. Here's why Jesus can say simply, follow me. It's because of this. Christ was all anguish, that I might be all joy. Christ was cast off, that I might be brought in. Christ was trodden down as an enemy, that I might be welcomed as a friend. Christ was surrendered to hell's worst, that I might attend heaven's best. Christ was stripped, that I might be clothed. Christ was wounded, that I might be healed. Christ was a thirst that I might drink. Christ was tormented that I might be comforted. Christ was made a shame that I might inherit glory. And Christ entered darkness that I might have eternal life. We could say it this way. Christ was thrust out of the kingdom so that we could come in. Follow me, says the one who will die for them. And only by dying for them can they Listen, heaven actually has no such thing as a pardon. Did you know that? There is no such thing as a pardon in heaven. It has no commuted sentences. It has no amnesty. Heaven has only the offer of an exchange. Free grace for the sinner and the cross for the Savior. There is only one who can offer heaven to us from God. And he is the one who took our place before God. There is only one who can turn God's judgment into an invitation of grace. And that is the one who traded God's favor towards him into a judgment against our sin. There is only one who can make fishing for men a metaphor of gathering people for salvation. Instead of a horrifying metaphor of God gathering people for judgment. And that is the one who faced that judgment in our place, who was bound so we could be free, who was pierced so we could be made whole, who was cast out so we can be brought in. This is the one offering this salvation to us. This is why, brothers and sisters, it is good news that the kingdom has come because the king will die to bring sinners into his kingdom. The great king will die so that the rebels can be set free. This is why it's good news. Otherwise, it would be bad news. Bad news for you. Bad news. The kingdom has come. Bad news, God could say. The judge has come. Bad news. The son who has been rejected comes with a rod of iron. The great fisherman comes with a hook to bring it into your jaw and to bring you into his slaughterhouse of condemnation. Bad news. The judge has come. No, no. Good news, Jesus proclaims. Good news in the land of darkness that now sees a great light. Good news in Galilee. There is a light of salvation offered because the light will go into darkness to save us. Good news. The reversal in this passage, the surprise in this passage, the command that comes with the authority of God's Son is that that Son will die so that that offer can be made to us. Who is the one who calls us? Who is the one who says to you, come, follow me? It is Jesus. It is Jesus who died so that he could invite us to God. So, let's consider that the one we are called to follow is the Lamb of God slain 
for the sinner. The shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The great fisher of men who will allow himself to be caught in the net of judgment and nailed to the cross of condemnation. This is the Jesus who spoke in Galilee about good news. This is the great fisherman who said to those men, come, I will make you fishers of men. And indeed, shouldn't we get up out of our boat and follow him? Shouldn't we willingly surrender everything else around us and follow him? Doesn't your heart want to say yes to him? Let us receive this good news and praise and glorify him for it. Let us, let us leap off the boat of our life and race after him with fresh joy and celebration. Traitors have been made into disciples, disciples into ambassadors, and rebels have been invited into the kingdom. Sons of hell have been made citizens of heaven. The Son of God calls us to come to God through 